Hello and welcome to the Binge Thinker episode 53. My name is Jimmy Raymond. It's an absolute pleasure to have you here as always. On this week's app and for the next few apps, I'm going to take you through a book called King, Warrior, Magician, Lover right here by Douglas Moore and no, Robert Moore and Douglas Gillette. And why this book is really interesting to me, it's a real great addition to the spiritual and self-discovery journey uh, that I found just by reading this book in the last week or two. And I think it'd be really helpful, you know, for the people that listen to this podcast. It's a bit of a through line talking about spirituality and developing yourself and transformation. It's certainly a book that I now think of as an essential tool to understanding the male psyche and, you know, understanding what it means to be a strong, healthy man in today's society. Um, we'll also go through um, Way of the Superior Man, which is probably the first book that I uh, really enjoyed in this sort of theme of, uh, you know, a spiritual guide to divinity and masculinity. Um, yeah, we'll go into that in a later round, but I thought this would be a good way to unpack this. I've been obsessed with this book over the last couple of weeks. It was actually recommended to me by my medical marijuana doctor and of all people, which is pretty cool. And he's quite a spiritual fellow as well um, and, you know, has a lot of knowledge about presence and Buddhism and yeah, just general spiritual practices, which I'm pretty sure comes hand in hand with, you know, giving people weed, which is not a bad thing, right? I'm very pro for it, but I thought it was a very interesting way to get guidance, spiritual guidance, um, you know, from a doctor of all people. And while this book is so useful, it really um, resonates with... You know, a common theme around, you know, boyhood versus manhood, the the constant threat or the constant attack on masculinity that I think a lot of us are seeing in society today as men. You know, there's a lot of complaints and there's this tearing down of the patriarchy and men are pigs and a lot of misandry that's sort of been sort of been taken over over the last 30, 40 years, maybe, you know, since the first wave of feminism. And Look, that has absolute merit, right, in the way that we have not treated the feminine, the way that we abuse power as men in society. Um, and now we're seeing a bit more of this swinging back of the pendulum, which is what I like to say about society as we're seeing, you know, over the last few years with a political correctness and a lot of, you know, left-leaning ideologies taking place in society. I think we've hit this point in time where we've sort of hit the pinnacle of that and people are going, whoa, 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 whoa. All right, if you want to be trans, that's cool, but keep your hands off my kids and, you know, your pronouns aren't that important and, you know what, let's just bing this back a little bit. That's how I see society uh, swinging back, you know, post this era of political correctness and workism, um, which is a lot, of, a lot of people, you know, like to shit on. So, yeah, with this re... Alignment, I'd say we're seeing people from like the intellectual dark web, people like your Joe Rogans, um, you know, your Jordan Peterson's even more, a bit more conservative, like your Ben Shapiro's are talking about more traditional values and traditional gender roles, which seems to resonate with a lot more men. And I do, I can't deny that it definitely resonates with me as I mature, um, you know, intellectually, personally, and sort of find my way and trying to define what being a man means to me. Um, why this was referred back to me, which I've come to realize now is an integration or a lack of integration of these mature masculine archetypes um, in my internal psyche. So how the book works is King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. Those are the four primary archetypes um, in the mature man. Um, they're, you know, they're, they're energies, they're senses, they're the examples that we see in society that we look up to as ideals. Um, and these are embodied in these sorts of energy patterns and these archetypal unconscious imagery that we find in Jungian psychology. And yeah, the, the, the more I read into this book, the more I tend to agree and found alignment and sense the, hey, oh yeah, I've seen this in me. Oh, oh, that's kind of interesting. And, you know, I have said in the past and I'll say it again, that good men are hard to find. So if I can do something towards making better men out there in society by sharing what I've learned. And I definitely think this book is aligned with me and my own capabilities and where I'm going for, what I'm aiming for in life, then, hey, I'm doing a good job here, aren't I? So, um, 
yeah, I wanted to talk through these books. It'll be a four-parter. So we'll go through each archetype and how the book works is you've got your archetype, right? For example, the king, and that's your ideal mature male archetype, masculine archetype. And then from there, you've got passive and active poles when you are out of alignment of that maturity of that archetype. And then from that archetype, there is also boy and man archetypes. So the man is the king, and then there'll be a boy archetype, which is the healthy inner child and the healthy element of the inner child, and then the unhealthy inner child, which is the active and passive poles um, of this function, which we'll go through in a bit more detail. So for example, in this episode, we'll go through the king, um, talk about the shadow archetypes of the king, what the king looks like in its fullness and its, in its highest ideal, and then look at the divine child, which is the precursor, the healthy precursor uh, to the king. And then there are also the shadow archetypes of the active and passive poles. So, you know, hopefully you get a little bit of resonance in this. Hopefully you see a little bit of yourself in this. Maybe you take something away. Highly recommend the book. I'll give it another plug so you can find it at the end. But without further ado, here we go. So, the key. All men aspire to be kings. We want to be kings in our own ways. We want to rule. We want to have power. We don't know what to do with this power, but in this highest ideal of what a king is. A good king is powerful. He's chosen by God. He's decisive. He's wise. You know, he's generative. He's generous, right? A good king rules over a kingdom, rules an empire, is remembered in eternity, and is a conduit to God, to the higher purpose of himself and for others. Now, despite how we criticize the patriarchy in modern times, and we seem to have lost touch with these men of great power in one society, patriarchies and kings have driven every great civilization, right? At the end of the day, even when the t- going gets tough between male and female dynamics, when the shit hits the fan, the feminine still relies on the masculine to protect and serve them, which we should do, right? So we all want to be king. What does a good king look like? What is the key functions of a king in his fullest expression? The two orders of the king is one, orderliness, and number two is fertility. Now, with order, a good king is the upholder of authority under God and the enforcer of law. These are the laws that they've usually brought about by themselves, been passed down by tradition, usually from other kings in their own lineage. Or maybe they are, um, you know, they are sort of messages from God and the divine order. Now, most kings are put in positions of demigod status. They are meant to be these vassals of God, of a higher power. We've seen that in every religion. You know, every god is gifted, sorry, every king is gifted the power of God. They usually have supreme power in whatever they rule. Now, what's important to understand about this power is the hierarchy of where the king sits. Good kings are actually not, I mean, they're high in the hierarchy, but they are not beyond the law that they upheld, and they are not beyond the God that honors them with this blessing if they so believe in a God, which they fucking should because they're in a really good position. And what we see in the book is great kings reinforce the way. They reinforce the law that they uphold and they are the examples of the law, right? Most of these laws, like we said, can be literal laws, societal laws. Some of these laws can be spiritual. So the, the, the great thing about this book is it provides lots of examples of... Um, you know, spirituality and these examples of good order in what a king should be in broad societal context, right? So when we talk about this divine order, the laws from above and God, the great examples they provide are like the Dharma of the Hindus or the Tao from the Taoists. Um, These are all religious orders that need to be adhered to no matter where you are in the hierarchy, so long as you are under the influence and the stewardship of God and the higher power. Now, 
the, one of the lines in the book that reinforces this is this really great line that goes, the king is the earthly conduit from the divine world, the source of king energy, the mediator between the mortal and divine. So similar to what we see in like religious figures, I mean, most kings are considered that, they usually are imbued with a higher purpose, a higher power, a higher order, and sort of distribute that and give that out towards the lands and the people that they you know, hold command over. It's not about this self-serving, um, you know, self-indulgent leadership that you see, and that's where it leads to tyranny and that, what's that leads to the breaking down of civilizations and these vassal states that the kings rule. So understanding what a good king is, they know that they are under God, they are under the law. Usually when they kick out of their place, if they think they're bigger than who they are, if they ordain themselves to be God or a higher power than that, usually they will find very quickly the gods, the divine beings, whatever rules over them, puts them pretty quickly into their place if it isn't the people that think this guy is too fucking arrogant to be in the power that he's in. So, for example, in the book, they use Caligula, a great example, where Caligula was a Roman emperor who was tyrannical, who was very self-involved. He insisted on having statues uh, made in his honour that were very expensive. He threw his people to the lions during um, the Colosseum days and the gladiator days out of sheer boredom. He would kill people just for his own entertainment. Eventually, that motherfucker only lasted four years in power and he was assassinated at the age of 28. So we see that as we increasingly rely on these people to give us leadership, if you do not serve the people, you're going to end up with a pretty severed head pretty fucking quickly. And then that's what, that's what we understand to be a king. When we think about king, it's about leadership. Kingship is essentially the pinnacle of leadership. Any good leader that has king energy must be the examples of the laws he upholds or that lack of integrity, that lack of clarity, that lack of do as I say, not as I do, that hypocrisy, that seeps into the land that seeps into the people they look after. They, you know, their their smartest counsel, the people they keep close to them can sense these weaknesses. Usually anyone that's outside the ego of the king can see this. And that eventually links, you know, breaks down the sentiment of where the king is held in power. And we see examples of this in almost all of our leadership today, societally. You know, you think about our political leaders. Everyone thinks they're bureaucrats and are just abusing the will and the money of the people. But we're so systemized and so conditioned to that, we just go, ah, politicians are a bunch of fuckwits. And we just let it be. Back in the day when so much relied on um, the will of the king and the will of the kingdom and its capability to deliver for the people, you know, many more people were reliant on that compared to today's society, which is largely more independent and privatized. Motherfuckers would, you know, behead a king. Just ask, you know, most of France for about 600 years, how many kings they beheaded or how much of the aristocracy they got rid of because they weren't serving the needs of the people. So if you want to keep your head, you've got to make sure that you are, you know, living in the interest of the people, whether to the land, which we'll cover in a bit, instead of operating in your self-interest. And by, you know, mitigating that self-interest, you know, aligning yourself to the order, the highest order, that integrity radiates through your actions into the goodwill of the people, and that usually leads to prosperity and success for where you lead and for how long you lead for. Now, the second function of the king is about fertility and blessing, right? Most kings were pretty abundant in their fertility. You know, men love to have the prize of women and procreation as a reward, right? You think about, um, what's his name? Genghis Khan. That guy fucked a lot, right? That guy went through most of Mongolia, Russia, you know, what's it? Uh, Western Asia, 
pillaging, raping, dominating. That's why there are so many Khans um, in East Asia. Or was it West Asia? West Asia, India, Pakistan, Mongolia. I've got a Khan lineage in there somewhere as well. I've got a 23 Me sitting in my office that I have to take care of uh, soon. And I'm pretty sure I have a little Mongolian in me. It's not a bad thing. Don't mind it. I like horses. But yes, kings love to fuck. Royalty love to fuck. From Genghis Khan to Zeus. Zeus was known, the Greek god of thunder and the, um, you know, the main Greek god. We all know who Zeus is. He was known for fucking, you know, just mortals, demigods, just spreading his seed wherever he could. Uh, another example that the book used is the Egyptian god Ra had a fucking harem, right? Even good Muslims who, you know, fight the jihad uh, are rewarded by God with sex, with their 72 virgins, with the abundance of pleasure in the afterlife in Jana, you know, for sacrificing, um, you know, a little bit of puss on the ground. <laughs> a little bit of puss on the ground. Uh, and now, generally, when you take away the degree of shame that Western culture has brought upon sexuality, a lot of Eastern cultures celebrate the dick, the hard dick, as a sign of fertility, right? You try to go find a bottle opener in Bali that isn't a dick shaped, you know what I mean? You see a lot of African and Eastern, you know, tribal culture medals of like, they got like statuettes of just big old tits or big old dicks, right? The, the dick wasn't seen as this icon of shame uh, that's usually just flashed around in Snapchat day to day as you see in today's society. But the important part of the factor of fertility is servicing the land and its people, right? We're talking about times where every kingdom was obsessed with growing, with for survival because birth rates, you know, were low. You know, people wanted, they wanted to expand their empires. It was very important to procreate, not as much as it is, you know, it's not so much today. But... This fertility is about growing the empire and serving the people, right? It was the duty of the king to find a queen and create children for the good of the empire to spread its fertility and its blessing and its conduism, conduism? the conduit of its godly and divine power to its children and to its empire. There was a great line in the book where it said the king is in reality wedded not to the queen but to the land in service of its people, right? This fertility was for the good of the empire, was to grow it, was to develop it with new life, you know, new subjects, new servants, expanding the empire. And when we think about spiritual principles, for example, one that was brought up um, in uh, Way of the Superior Man is that your purpose must come before your woman, right? So if you put this idea of this spiritual hierarchy of, you know, the male ideal, this fertility was for the purpose of the king, which was to serve and to lead. And that's why you see a lot of kings that, yes, may have had a queen, but they had harems and they had concubines, Right? And these weren't legitimate children to the throne, but they were still children that were of, you know, royal lineage, holy lineage that served to expand the empire and served to expand the kingdom um, and just bring that new life and that new growth to it. I mean, you can also not understand where this shit can go wrong because most uh, modern hierarchies or most modern monarchies, so to speak, involved a little bit of incest uh, to keep the bloodlines pure. And we know over time that actually degrades the quality of the bloodline, but they didn't understand genetics back then, right? It's only a modern um, sort of uh, discovery, uh, the risks and the negatives of inbreeding. And it makes me wonder back then, not that I know now, what do they think when they had all these incestuous children that were cousins that had deformities. I, there was, I read somewhere like towards the end of a particular French lineage, 
there was one French king that was like pretty hideous. And there was another, um, I forget who it was. It was one of the Egyptian pharaoh and he was a, he was a kid. Don't know, I can't remember which one it was. But yeah, he was also quite disfigured from all the inbreeding of trying to keep things in the family, you know, trying to fuck on a first cousin. I don't know if they fucked sisters or not, probably not that close, but they kept it within a pretty tight blood range. No good. Just in case you didn't know, there was no good. (laughs) But the other aspect of the generativity of a king about this blessing and this fertility is also about sharing these blessings and powers with the people, right? You, you want to be that king that's out, you know, you want to be the man of the people, showering your most loyal servants and your soldiers with gold and rewards and praise. And this sort of anointment, I would say, or these blessings are really important in a man's development from boyhood to feel that acceptance from the king, from the leaders, from our elders, that we are part of the tribe. That's really important and a a key factor in the missing link between boyhood to manhood in one society is that initiation uh, and the testing of a boy's capabilities to officially mark him into manhood. You know, we see that in a lot of African cultures, a lot of Native American cultures, Even the Jews have bar mitzvahs where you're officially a man at 13, despite what your frail body says. So showing this blessing, showing that you are being noticed, that you are being included as part of the kingdom, that responsibility that our elders have to serve the young generation, the next generation with the wisdom and the insight and the guidance, particularly from someone that has hopefully a good king, decades of experience and, you know, loving insight from being a great king that he can pass on in that wisdom that can be repeated, improved upon, evolved for generations to come to keep the empire fresh, healthy, and moving forward. So kings nowadays, you know, are more often than not the, you know, the stories of yesteryear. There's not many kings in today's society. I mean, we've got Charles, but again, he's just there for looks and, you know, looks is a bit of a stretch. So where do we see kings and examples of kings in modern society? And the short answer is it's pretty hard to fucking find them, right? This is a key aspect of where we are challenged um, in modern society by the lack of mature masculine and the lack of examples of that in today's society. Even things like the hero, the modern day hero, is surprisingly an aspect of um, immature and boy psychology as opposed to mature man psychology. But we'll get to that uh, in the next episode when we talk about the warrior. So where can we find great examples of masculine leaders in today's society? Where are our modern kings? Your best your best solution is probably in something like business, right? Because that is where you see empires at work. They might not be bound to, you know, the land or a country, but these empires are modern empires of their brand and what they produce and what they're capable of. When you go to that, I mean, who would your great leaders that sort of match some of these, um, you know, these key functions in in a good kingship, maybe someone like Elon, maybe Elon Musk. I mean, if you think about what Elon does, he is in service to humanity with SpaceX and Tesla trying to get to Mars and trying to become, make us a multi-planetary species. And also he provides great strong leadership in multiple organizations, has founded multiple companies. And actually, as far as gener- generativity goes, Elon fucks, man. Elon's got 10 kids with three different women. You wouldn't think it, but that guy fucks. (laughs) So the best that we can do without these examples 
in the mainstream, in society necessarily, is to channel our own inner king, right? And that's what we should be doing, understanding that these four key archetypes, the king, warrior, magician, the lover, these are energies, these are archetypes that are central to us as mature men in society. And how can we resonate with that energy in our day-to-day lives? Well, it's just living by the values of the king, understanding you know, being pious, understanding and respecting a higher power, even if you may be an atheist or agnostic, is understanding that there is this greater force beyond the chaos that you might see of modern society. It's, uh, you know, upholding the law, upholding justice and being generative and generous in your own life, in your own little empire, right? As men... And as individuals, regardless of gender, we are the centers of our own universe, whether we are consciously aware of it or not. Because when we'll talk about in another episode about um, the hermetic principles, the hermetic principle number one is the universe is all mental, right? It's all in here. It's all in our heads. So when you live in the central locus of the universe of yourself because you only have your own experience to resonate with, You are the king of your own empire, whether you like it or not. And these kingly energies will resonate with you and will be thrust upon you once you move through your life, through society, once you have your own family, if you start your own business, if you're in a leadership position, all of these aspects of life require an embodiment of good, healthy king energy for those tasks or those functions to flourish in your existence. So, you know, something as simple as having your own family, right, being the king to your little empire. Maybe you've got a wife and a couple of kids. That's your empire. It doesn't have to be huge. It doesn't have to be, you know, there's this big disconnect of empires have to be this massive fucking empire. You rule over thousands of people. Most people can't be fucked dealing with that, right? If you are imbibing and integrating that king energy by being, you know, healthy and generous with your children, Um, you know, being intentful with your your loved ones, being of service to them, being generous, being generative to them, making sure they've got, you know, health and wealth and success, building for that. That is a great way to embody that energy. And I'm sure you will at some point in that journey by being your own inner king in that space in the spaces that you do control and exist in. You know, in my own life, I try to embody the king as much as I can in my own world and am increasingly aware of my capacity to do so. You know, acting in the way of order and generativity or fertility, I'm used and quite accustomed to maintaining order. I'm usually in leadership positions. I'm usually looked upon to provide advice to provide structure and guidance and leadership. You know, I've delivered projects. I've been the head of many different things in my time at only 32, even to a point now where, you know, the businesses that I create are an example of my order and my fertility because without my order and my deliberate consciousness into these buildings, sorry, not these buildings, these projects and these businesses I create, and my generative and my fertile capacity to be strong and, you know, live with vigor and want to live abundantly and provide abundantly because I do these things, not necessarily for myself, but for the benefit of others. That is, to me, that integration of that king energy. And as I mature through this process of becoming a better business person and actually building these businesses to success eventually, you know, I'll further align with that king energy and hopefully have my own empire, you know, pretty soon. But I think, yeah, a lot of people, you know, feel disconnected from this power, this mature masculine power, because, you know, we lack so many things we've just talked about then. We haven't talked about initiation from our own fathers. There's a lot of disconnect from the media of what manhood should be and this idea that you are you have no power unless you've got a lot of money or a lot of wealth um, or you have, you know, 
have been inherited to you. It seems like such a struggle to move from have not to have, but that really is up to the individual to, you know, challenge that resolve externally and push against it with your own internal motivations and capabilities. But yeah, I think with the movies and the media, we think that this opportunity for more is in the hands of other people, this us versus them, this disconnect, right? It's for the magnets, the business magnets and the the ballers that are fucking throwing dollars around, right? And all this material success, but what they don't understand, a lot of them, is they're channeling an internal energy to get to these points, if done in a healthy manner. And if you can become increasingly conscious of those moments where you feel like you are that powerful and just and fair and pious individual, that is the taste of kingship within yourself. And you've got to find ways to reinforce that or make it happen more often in your life so you can feel more integrated as a human being and as a mature masculine man. So those are the good things about being a king, right? But what are the shadow sides of kings? What is the negatives? Where can it go wrong for kings uh, in modern society and ancient society too? So what... Um, this book does is it models these archetypes again on two phases, uh, boy psychology and man psychology. So, and in these um, two tiers, they're pyramid shaped. So at the top of the man psychology pyramid is the king. And then on the bottom two corners is the active and the passive poles. So these is parts of your psyche that are either hyperactive in the shadow or very passive in the shadow, right? The negative aspects of who we are. In the active pole of the, of the king pyramid is the tyrant king, okay? So the tyrant king, he operates out of ego and he is very internally uncentered. He's an unbalanced man. That's the whole point of the active and passive, right? You are not in your highest, most centered, balanced form. The tyrant king, Usually self-aggrandizing, covering up for their own insecurity. You know, again, that lack of internal belief, lack of internal centeredness, and that comes out in, you know, egotistical lashing out. Right? We've all seen people, you know, on the back foot, people think that they're top shit, um, you know, talk, and I've been that person as well, you know, I put my hand up here, you know, lashing out and sort of deflecting onto others um, to compensate for their lack of internal security. And what we see often in these tyrants, kings, is a lack of um, this generosity, the generativity, the fertility. I mean, I'm sure they fuck, but it's not from a perspective of abundance and growing and expanding and a being of service to the people that they serve. They usually are destructive because they see anything that is good and new and positive in their worlds as a threat to their power and ultimately a threat to their egos and their identities. Now, there's a great saying by Jocelyn Murray that sort of lines up with this that says, weak men cannot handle power. It will crush them or they will use it to crush others. Now, this line to me speaks directly to tyranny. Right? Oppressive and cruel rule by leaders, often to compensate for their lack, again, a lack of internal belief. And what they will usually do is crush others. They'll deflect out. Going back to that example of uh, Caligula, again, tyrannical Roman emperor, one of the Stoics, Seneca was actually alive during uh, Caligula's time and witnessed his rule and called him short tempered killing people on a whim, sleeping with other women's wives and spending exorbitantly on statues of him to be worshipped, right? Talking before, Caligula even went so far in his arrogance to declare himself a god, which is usually reserved for emperors when they die. They presumed in the Roman times that um, emperors were, again, a vassal of God and would become gods upon their death. But he got the line because he was too, cool, too full of his own shit 
and said he was a God walking the planet Earth. What happens when you think you're God? The gods will go, oh, really? Is that right? <laughs> Assassinated at 28 by his own people, right? Again, that arrogance to put yourself out of the hierarchy, to put yourself out of turn, to speak out of line, will usually get you fucked up by these holier and higher divine powers that are not subject to these shadows and these corruptions because they are the divine. So the other side, the passive pole of the Shadow King is the weakling, right? So this is someone, when we go back to that quote, weak men cannot handle power, it will crush them, or they will use to crush others. They are the ones that usually get crushed by the sheer amount of responsibility and power that is handed to them, and they do not have the internal strength and internal capability to handle it, right? And you don't really see a lot of passive kings or a lot of weakling kings because in nowadays, particularly in society, to you, hand power is given a lot more often than it is just handed down, right? We do see examples of that in nepotism where you know, rich fathers and rich businessmen will give businesses to their kids and they fuck it over to people that are irresponsible and don't know how to run this shit. But... Generally, in today's society, people are going to catch you out pretty quickly for being, you know, a spineless pushover in business and society nowadays, right? They can smell it on you. In the olden days, there's a lot more distance between you and the powers that be, and they had not they didn't have media to showcase how much of a fuck what you were. So they still, so these weakling kings, they have this lack of security, they've got this lack of center, and they're very paranoid about being seen for this weakness, right? They're probably not as, you know, seen by the public. Again, they probably fear, you know, new powers, new life, new energy in their kingdoms and in their charges because they feel like it's more opportunities for them to be undone. And a great example from the book um, is the saying, absolute power corrupts absolutely. And what happens is, all of the passive poles that we'll talk about in these archetypes can only remain passive for so long. In the balance of energy between the positive and the negative, the active and the passive, you can't repress this activity um, or you can't repress these energies for too long or else they will come up and bite you in the fucking ass. That's why people die of heart attacks or they get into rage fits or you know, they fucking blow up after so much repression because this energy has to go somewhere. So even the most passive and the weaklings of kings will eventually, through enough pressure, explode into tyranny, okay? Now, what can we take from this aspect is keep an eye out, you know? Keep an eye out for anyone you perceive to be that weakling, anyone that you perceive to be that soft element, right? A, a great example of that would be <laughs> your school shooters. Usually the school shooters in modern society are passive beta males. Um, actually, the weakling is also the passive element of the child psychology, the boy psychology as well, so we'll talk about that in a sec. But, you know, soft people don't stay soft for long or they at least explode with massive force because they've imploded within their own weakness and their inability to maintain themselves from their lack of internal structure, right? So, you know, like a star that collapses eventually over its own weight, so will a passive person and explode and you do not want to be in the blast radius when it happens. So we've talked about now the mature masculine archetype for the king, so now the boy psychology, the immature but also healthy aspect of uh, the divine king is the divine child archetype. Right? So like any legitimate king, the child in us is divine as well, also a vassal from God. Like the king is the center of his universe, the divine child is also a mysterious gift from the universe in the center of it, loved by all, radiating both power and innocence, right? The child within us, this inner child, 
has the recipe for success, is destined for greatness, but he must be protected and nurtured to fulfill their life's work. Perfect example of this, Jesus, right? Jesus, the son of Mary, a miracle of God, seen to by the mystic kings of the East. They understand that this child is divine and is adored by powerful kings from foreign lands. You know, this circulation of this adoringness, this, you know, potential, this um, reveredness for the child, for what it's capable of, the center of the universe, powerful, but again, extremely fragile, right? Most of these examples you think are, are Western and Eurocentric, but there's actually other great examples of, you know, the divine child in Eastern philosophy as well. For example, Buddha was actually raised and born, sorry, born and raised by um, a regional king in like India, Tibet, and then moved from this divine child, was gifted and was soon to be a king in his lands, and then moved into the asceticism of Buddhism uh, once he realized how far he was and how distant he was from the realities of life and how much suffering that existed in the world. But if it wasn't for that divine light and that childlike innocence and purity that resonated with him to, and compelled him to live as the people and understand the suffering of the everyday man, he wouldn't have had the compulsion to do that. Right? He wouldn't, if he was not the divine child and he was, you know, a passive or an active shadow, maybe he just goes up, stays up in the kingdom and goes, you know what? I'm good. I'm here to self-serve. I'm not here to serve the needs of the people. So how this divine child manifests itself in adults, in one society, is an element of that healthy inner child, right? Just as we in, you know, psychological and trauma circles need to work on healings in a child, you know, you'll find as we go through this series, you'll find an understanding of where you see the shadow parts of yourself in these children. Um, eventually, once you heal that inner child and you are healthy, that is where that, again, the childlike wonder we talk about, that zest for life, that creativity, um, that energy that we know that we need to keep in touch with when we were more innocent and full of energy and, you know, just full of radiance. You've got to keep that aspect of your psyche in there, but do not constantly identify with the child because you have to be the man the majority of the time. Right? So that's the divine child. That's the healthy child in its power and its fullness. So what happens when the shadows take over? So the first aspect of the shadow child is the weakling, like we talked about, right? You're going to see manifestations of the mature shadow masculine in the immature child, because realistically, we are not all men in society. Most of us as men are hurt inner children or hurt children that are stuck at a certain psychological level because of trauma, because of something to happen to us or a lack of example of what maturity looks like um, in our development, right? So, you know, there's a great saying that I think about a lot is that, yeah, there are no adults, only hurt children. And that's where you're going to see a lot of the elements of who we think we are in these clips. Sorry, in these clips. <laughs> I'm thinking about the clips I have to make in a bit in these examples. So like we talked about the weakling king in the passive um, mature masculine archetype, we're going to see the weakling in the passive shadow child as well, right? And what does that person look like? Probably a little bit more common. You know, they're the kind of dipshit kind of kids that have no personality, not a lot going on, no initiative, right? They're coddled and they're at the center of the universe like a divine child is, but that's because they're fragile, right? They're usually the kids that are hypochondriacs and they really hang around with the other kids, a bit of an outsider, a bit of a loner, not much zest for life. You know, everything is effort. Everything is somebody else's fault probably aren't doing much of themselves, not really, no really indication for talent or anything like that. But 
Yeah. Usually, again, like we talked about with the passivity of the weakling, the passivity of the weakling child is going to follow into their adult life. Usually, it's, you know, probably as an incel or some sort of keyboard warrior or a school shooter. And eventually, this repression of the nature, the active nature that exists within all of us, will eventually flip on itself, implode, and then explode into the active pole of the shadow child, which is called the high chair tyrant. Now, the high chair tyrant is, you know, pretty common, I think. It's probably the easiest example of these. We've seen a bunch of high chair tyrants around. These are the fucking, you know, little molly coddled kids with a god complex that you know you know this the goldilocks of the world right it's too hot i need this you aren't doing this for me i want this now you know there's little rat back kids from um child and chocolate factory right uh that little bitch that ended up being a blueberry or augustus you know as well augustus darling save some for later you know what are these brand share tyrants They're grandiose, they're arrogant, they're irresponsible, you know, all the good things are their idea, all the bad things are somebody else's, right? Those are the screaming kids in the lolly aisle of the supermarket that you just want to shove into a fucking freezer for a few minutes just to, you know, cool off for maybe an hour or two. And usually, again, these kids exist, these shadow sides of kids exist generally as a resulting shadow of the parents themselves. Maybe it's a lack of discipline from the father. Maybe the father is completely absent about keeping the child in line, in order, and, you know, replicating what emotional regulation means or, you know, being able to regulate emotion and communicate that to their children. And, you know, most men are not very good at that. And I'm probably speaking out of turn as someone that doesn't have a child themselves. And they're going, you don't know how hard it is to be a parent. Fair, I'm, you know, fair enough, but I'm just talking from the outsider's perspective here, okay? And, yeah, with this lack of discipline from the parental side of things, again, that could be a lack of that king energy, right? Filtering, it's not filtering down, it's not penetrating the kids. Oh, probably shouldn't have said it like that. But it's not being exemplified and being taken in and it, you, again, like any good leadership, if it doesn't come from the top down, if you don't provide those examples from the top, there's no example to follow and there's nothing to replicate from children as the insatiable learning machines that they are. And then where are these kids? Where are you seeing these kids? You see them everywhere, right? Like we said before, there are no adults, only hurt children. You see these hurt children everywhere. They're in corporate bro culture. Right, they are, you know, any egotistical leader. And because again, we are just all sitting at different psychological levels and we are largely unaware of it until you actually work on your shit, which people don't really do. And you know, again, they're the same people. They're the ones that want to be the guy in the flashy car and they want to be the leader without any responsibility and they want the big check with, again, all care, no responsibility. They want the title, they want the status, but they do not shoulder the responsibility and the accountability that it takes to be a good leader, to be a good king. And again, because they are not mature, because they are still her children, they don't have those facets and it's going to take a fucking reality kick or a guillotine to get them acting right, if at all. And, you know, because you can see that happen. It's like they're like, you know, it's like a shitty Pokemon, right? You can see the high chair tyrant evolve into the tyrant king because it's the same fucking qualities over and over again. The same arrogance, the same demandingness, the same um, narcissism is all the ingredients are there. They're just evolved over time because that's all they've done to mature over that progress and linearity of time itself. Similar to Caligula, some of the examples that this book gave. Um, were other sociopaths like Stalin and Hitler. You know, these are the tyrants that demanded everything from everyone all of the time. Now, actually, take a bit of a sideward step. Actually, maybe not, because Hitler's a good example of this. Another way that this high chair tyrant can manifest itself outside of being the tyrant itself 
is the perfectionist within us, is that part of ourselves that is constantly demanding more of ourselves, but then we beat ourselves up for not meeting these ridiculous and exorbitant demands that we think that we're capable of, again, because of these elements of our psyche that have been left untethered, undisciplined, um, and not you know, self-regulated by our higher consciousness, our king consciousness, whatever you decide to call it. And I'm very guilty of that as well. Out of, you know, I to use myself as an example uh, in all of this, I certainly align with the high chair tyrant as a kid. I have been uh, the, you know, the tyrant king to a degree uh, in my life, but nowhere near as much because, again, most of my tyrant Elements have been as a hurt child as opposed to an integrated, mature masculine. Um, you know, as a kid, when I was an only child, I was definitely a spoiled little brat. I, you know, I was coddled um, a little bit by my parents, got all the things that I wanted, had a bit of an attitude from what other people told me. But as I've gotten older and matured a bit, I've largely let a lot of that go. I can definitely tell you that I've had to do a lot of work to fix the perfectionist in me. But yeah, that's just a way to illustrate how this can apply to you. Now, as for the examples of, you know, modern high chair tyrants, my favorite example would be probably Trump, right? That's who I think of when I see the high chair tyrant. It's pretty easy to see Trump, you know, with his big baby face. No, you're bad, I'm the best, everything's wrong, China. You know, you can see him on one of his ignorant tirades in a high chair, dirty bib, probably piss, you know, and just teeing off about what's wrong with society and how he's great and it's always somebody else's fault. Now, hopefully, he doesn't end up like Stalin and Hitler, but we'll probably find out in 2024 because right now he's leading, he's leading the de Democratic um, fucking, not the Democratic, he's leading the Republican ticket for re-election next year, which is not looking good. And that's it for this week, guys. Talking about the king, the divine child, and the shadows of the king, shadow of the children. Again, fantastic book, King Warrior, Magician Lover. We've got three more weeks of this. We'll be covering the magician, the warrior, and the lover uh, over the next few weeks. If you want to get this book, look up on Amazon, King Warrior, Magician Lover by Robert Moore or Douglas Gillette. Highly recommend it. I think it was like 20 something bucks. Good reading when you're bored. Or, you know, save yourself the effort and just come back to this every week for the next four weeks and get a free dose. Mwah. Enjoy. I kind of fucked that up. I'm doing this quite late in the evening. I'm running out of brain. On a side note, folks, um, the mailing list competition is done and I want to give a big old congratulations to John Buckle. John, congratulations, buddy. Thank you for signing up. You have won the one-year subscription to Waking Up. I will contact you personally this week uh, with the access code. Thank you for being a part of it. Um, and, folks, thank you for being a part of this episode. Um, you know where to find me on all the socials, at Jamil J. Raymond on the interwebs. Like, share, subscribe. Get this out to a friend if you think this could be a benefit to them. Next week, we'll cover off part two of The Warrior. The Warrior of uh, this four-part series. My name is Jamil Raymond. It's an absolute pleasure. Binges, thank you very much. See you next week. Ciao for now.